everyone can do something with AI, whether it's for your business, for your community. So definitely be the driver, but don't don't give in to the fear. At the end of the day, remember it's a tool. Think of it as a hammer. Do I want to use this to create something, or do I want to use it to destroy something? That's what we should all be thinking about. And so, if you're really worried about AI or trying to figure out how you can be hopeful about it, think about how you can use it to create something. Welcome to another episode of the Hope Strategy Podcast. Corey Blake here with Josh Dimley. What's up, Josh? Hey, everybody. <laughs> oh, man. that uh, We just talked with Neil. What's Neil's last name? Sahoda. Neil Sahoda, an expert in AI. We'll leave it at that. And Josh is going to read his full bio. Here, I'll, I'll, I'll read it from the uh, back of his book here, Own the AI Revolution. That's Neil's book. And it says, Neil is a sought after business consultant and serves as the AI subject matter expert for the United Nations, working to achieve the sustainable development goals through AI and build a better future for all. He helped create the AI ecosystem that famously won Jeopardy, which we talked to him about on the show. Another thing that it doesn't say here is that he worked with IBM on Watson, which Watson is the name for this AI program computer technology thing that became famous because it won Jeopardy. Beat Ken Jennings. Yeah. And it's done all sorts of other things too, competing against human beings and just taking on all sorts of tasks. And so Neil is at the forefront of what's going on with artificial intelligence, but he is very positive about the future of AI. And that's why we wanted to have him on. Yeah. I think when you look at like education gaps, And we talked about this, the fear that comes, the natural fear that comes from a lack of understanding. This is like, I don't know that there's anything more uh, kind of concentrated with that whole idea, right? Of just artificial intelligence at this point is something that pretty much everybody, obviously we have listeners all over the world, but the ones in the ones in most places now are using AI on a day-to-day basis in the way they interact with their phone, sometimes their car, their Google home, their Alexa, whatever, right? And it's something that on the surface we're beginning, we understand now a little bit as users, but as far as what the capabilities are of it, there's just this huge education gap. And I love that Neil is trying to close that gap as quickly as possible because that the fear that people have in AI and robots taking over the world comes from a lack of understanding and and knowing not only how it works, but also as Neil was telling us, how you can become a part of how it works and how you can educate yourself on how it works so that you can be a contributor to making sure that it works for the good of humanity. Man, what an expert and what an amazing experience. I, I keep thinking like, how are we getting these people to come onto the podcast? Like this guy's <laughs> the, the, the specialist on AI for the UN speaking to the United Nations. He's a, he's the CIO at UC Irvine. And I mean, he's one of the guys that built Watson. Watson changed the game, by the way, for AI, right? That Like that was kind mm-hmm. of, To this day, a lot of people only know when they think of AI, it's like, oh, well, that thing IBM did that beat the guy in Jeopardy, you know, but there's so much more to it. And what a, what a smart guy. That was awesome. Yeah. Unfortunately, AI, when it works, it's kind of invisible. It just works. Stuff just works. And we don't know why it's working because we're not even thinking about it. When something goes wrong, like somebody's Tesla malfunctions, then we hear about it. It's all over the news. And in movies, you see there are some positive examples. I mean, there's positive AI and Interstellar and Star Trek and Minority Report and some other movies, but then it's outnumbered 10 to 1 by the negative examples like Terminator and stuff. And so I can see how even the politicians would be swayed by this and say, well, all I ever have heard is that AI is going to kill us all. Yeah. And you get smart people too, like, Musk and other people talking about this, how it's inevitable AI is going to raise up and rise up and kill us all. But Neil's point is it's not inevitable. We're in control and we can decide what it does and what it doesn't do. It's a tool like any other tool. You're going to learn a lot in this episode about AI and how it works and why it works and and hopefully come out of the conversation that we had with Neil a lot more hopeful for the future of, of AI and, and what it's going to do for humankind. So Enjoy this episode of the Hope Strategy Podcast with Neil Sahota. Something is happening in our world. Time is very precious. 
I'm going to show you how great I am. Hope in the face of difficulty. More than machinery, we need humanity. Hope in the face of uncertainty. I'm better now than I was. I'm experienced now. <laughs> Changing the world can happen anywhere, and anyone can do the it. The audacity of hope. This is the Hope Strategy Podcast with Corey Blake and Josh Steinley. We've got Neil with us here today. He's the author of this book on the AI revolution. And one of the reasons that we invited Neil on the show is because Neil has a positive vision of the future of AI, artificial intelligence and technology and robots and all that stuff and what it can mean for us in our society. But before we get into that, Neil, take us through a little bit of your upbringing, because there's no way that 30 years ago or whenever you were a little kid, you were thinking, you know, when I grow up, I want to be an AI expert because that wasn't even much of a thing 30 years ago. So how did you get from where you came from to where you are today? Honestly, it was probably a little bit of an accident and a whole lot of luck. <laughs> but I, I really give a lot of credit to my parents. I mean, they uh, it's still a real deep sense of community service and give back. You know, when they actually came to the U.S., they didn't really know anybody. You know, my dad had taken a job out here and they literally had 20 pounds in their, in their pounds as the currency in their wallet and basically try to start a whole new life out here. And they always believe that, look, if you do good things, right, you should just do them because it's the right thing to do. Not necessarily that people will return the favor, but they felt that living a good life was the most important thing. And so I actually grew up with that upbringing. And so I always was looking, okay, what could I do? How can I help contribute, right? How can I help solve big problems to that helps everybody? And that's taken me down quite an interesting path. And, you know, 15 years ago when business intelligence was a thing and I was, you know, management consultant working with these global Fortune 500 companies. And I was like, hey, it's amazing what the computers are telling us. Like computers are telling us anything, all right? We collect all this data, we can slice and dice it up, we create these cool looking reports, but the machines aren't telling us anything, but what if they could? And that's what kind of sent me down the AI path and started me thinking about if machines can do this, how can we then use this for social good as well? So was there a point at which you said, hey, this AI stuff, this is what I want to tie my horse to, this is the exciting thing, or was it more just a gradual set of steps, one thing leading to another? I think it was a, a kind of a gradual series of steps, but there was an accelerator. So working on this and, you know, getting people into the right mindset, it's like, it's, it's a long path. It's a journey. And so I'm thinking, okay, you got to take things stepwise. You got to help people, you know, until, until maybe the last couple of years, people really thought of like social enterprise, like either you made money or you did good, like you were a nonprofit. Never thinking about you can marry the both, but, Five years ago, I had the opportunity to actually give a keynote in front of the United Nations. And they had their 17 sustainable development goals. And, you know, I talked about how AI could be used for public service, for the, the SDGs. You know, I was speaking to an audience where they thought it was Terminator time. That machines are going to rise up, eradicate humanity. And my speech was actually well received. And that night I was approached by the secretary general and said, you've actually opened up our eyes. We never thought we could do <laughs> use AI for good. It's like, there's an opportunity here, the member nations, there's momentum. Let's do something. And that became kind of the jump start into this whole span of doing good with AI. So I want to dive into that good stuff, but before we get there, tell us a little bit about your stint on Jeopardy. Alex Trebek recently passed away, so this is timely as we're considering the future of Jeopardy, but tell us about the uh, time you got to participate. IBM Watson, it was born out of the idea, could a machine play Jeopardy? Literally that game. The, the three original guys, they were at the IBM bar. I, IBM has its own bar, in the, one of the research centers, and Jeopardy happened to be on TV. And that, that was the challenge in that it's like, it's not just like playing chess. You have to think about natural language and we ask negative questions and in Jeopardy, it's you get the answer, you get the question. And so going through this process, we weren't sure if could we even do this. 
But when we approached Jeopardy about doing this challenge, we actually had to agree to it two years in advance. Wow. So <laughs> we didn't know if we could actually do this or not. And at the time, Sam Palmazano was the CEO and he's like, can you guys do this? And it's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> So then because of that, the Jeopardy arranged the, the champions, Ken and Brad and the special setup and, you know, the, the marketing lead up, all this stuff. But it was a two year process. And honestly, I mean, it's no secret today that the, the night of the challenge, it was 50 50 that Watson would even work. And there was a bit of skepticism. And you know, Alex Trebek was in great spirits. He's like, this is kind of an interesting social experiment. Let's see what happens. But at the end of the day, Watson actually won, which surprised even us. We just thought it would do all right, and it did not start off well. But a testament how quickly machines learned, it turned it around. But even Alex was commenting afterwards that it wasn't just that it could answer these questions. It was that it was actually employing strategy. And it would change its strategy based on where it was in the game. Like it was behind, it was ahead. You know, trying to block the other players from getting the daily doubles. And that was kind of the the game changer moment for everybody. Now, what year was that? That was 2011, so almost 10 years ago. So almost 10 years ago, what has changed in the AI field over the past nine, 10 years? A lot. I mean, aside from the technology maturing and the increased level of data to actually teach the machines, we've kind of gone from more about fear, right? That, oh, it's going to kill off people or it's going to take our jobs to now most people are actually asking the question, what should I do with AI? Right? I know I need to do something. How do I figure that out and how do I get started? So if you're going to compare the state of AI to like video game consoles, where would you say we are? Are we like in the 80s Atari stage of AI or are we with PS4 or where are we at? Well, if we were to start with, I guess, Pong <laughs> as, a, as the first one and we'll use the PS5 as kind of the, the penultimate because that's what we have today. No no offense to Xbox. Um, <laughs> we're We're probably kind of in the Sega Dreamcast stage of AI. Wow. Sega Dreamcast. What a callback. <laughs> <laughs> the Sega CD. That was a big deal. <laughs> so there's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of progress to be made, right? There, There is. Look, there's a lot that's been done, but we've barely scratched the surface of what's possible. Mm-hmm. And in large part in that we're used to computers helping us do something faster, cheaper, less errors. We suddenly have machines that can actually answer questions we don't know the answer to. And so we haven't learned how to fully tap into these capabilities. That's actually the big people challenge at the moment. That's what everyone is trying to get their arms around. So I I have a big people question as it pertains to all this. So you mentioned that you spoke at the United Nations and that after you said it was the secretary general that came up and talked to you. So he comes up to you and he's like, man, we were just thinking of all the negatives about that, you know, and we're, and we're fine. Our eyes have been opened. Why, why do you think in your experience talking about this so much? I mean, you've spoken all over the world about this stuff. I mean, for crying out loud, you spoke to the United Nations about it. Why is the immediate connotation when people think of AI, especially these world leaders, you would hope that they were looking at it optimistically. You would hope that the conversations they were having were, how can we utilize this to solve world hunger and solve war and all of these things, you know, get rid of these things. But instead, they're they're fearful of it, it sounds like. Why is that the natural instinct? I, I think it's because most people are afraid of change, to be honest. right? It's not necessarily just the technology or AI. It's lots of things in life where something changes. It seems like 90% of people's their reaction is, oh, my God, what does this mean? How does this impact me? And they start thinking the bad things. It's just like we talk about like risk management or identifying risks. People gravitate to the negative, what's going to go wrong. And it's like risk isn't necessarily a bad thing. You have positive risks, you have negative risks. Risk is just an uncertain event, but we never train our minds to think about the positive risks, right? Those are actually opportunities. Yeah. So you have 90% of the population that was instantly fearful, right? And we were getting death threats in the Watson days. To yet 10% of the people thinking like, hey, I wonder what I could do this. What could I unlock here? And I think that's why I always say the big challenge is the people challenge. We were never quite in the right mindset and saying, look, at the end of the day, this is a tool. 
it's a hammer. I can use it to create something or I can use it to destroy something. Yeah. But the choice is on us as people. Yeah. And it's the unknown, I guess, too, the fear of the unknown when, yeah. when you don't understand something and I guess your only influencers influences are sci-fi and Terminator, like you put it, then it's a lot easier to be fearful and, and scared when you don't understand the ins and outs of it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Corey, and le- you know, all the, uh, you know, culture references, media books, TV films aside, we also unfortunately live in a world right now where bad news is good news. As much as, you know, people say we want the uplifting stories, what gets the ratings is the bad stuff. And that just encourages more fear mongering. So what were some of the things that you said when you spoke at the UN that changed their minds? And what year was that again? That was 2015. 2015. So what were some of the things that you told them? I told them a little bit about what AI is, but I focused more on how it's actually being used. And so I had talked about some of the things around behavioral health, helping people that were actually uh, impoverished or homeless, um, how it's actually even being used for things to improve like recycling and like waste collection. So that was things like they never thought of, right? You think of something as innocuous as, you know, trash, but it's actually a big problem. And so Rather than talk about these big grandiose ideas like, hey, we're going to cure cancer, or we're going to send people throughout space. I wanted to show them stuff that's not just near term tangible, but stuff that's actually happening today. Because I think that made it more real, that these aren't just like sky high type of dreams. There's real value to be tapped into and real value that can be unlocked in the near term. You know, one of my favorite movies is Interstellar, and there are some robots with AI in there. One of them's named Matthew McConaughey. Um, (laughs) No, actually, I love Matthew McConaughey, but I saw that movie and I thought, oh, that'd be so sweet if I had a robot that I could talk to like this and it can do stuff. And I think that movie came out in 2014. And now the way that I interact with my Google Home device or your Apple Pod or Alexa or whatever it's not all that far from what we saw in that movie with the robots. I mean, it's not there yet either, but it's not that far away. It's much more, it seems like, you know, we're a couple of years away from that. Have you seen that movie? You know what I'm talking about with the Taurus, the big blocky (laughs) robots. Like how far are we away from actually having AI that can respond with that kind of interaction to us? I think with that level of interaction, we're, we're there. We actually have that ability to do that. I think being able to respond to like a one-on-one conversation, we're actually still far away. AI can only do what we teach it and it only knows what we teach it. And so just you think about a general conversation, the the variability in it, we need lots and lots of data to teach the machine, right? They're not out there looking, I, I will learn how to drive a car. I will learn how to play chess. I will learn about baseball. They're passive, right? So unless you teach them all about these different things, it's not gonna, it's not gonna know. Now they, they get really good at the things that we teach, but we have no way just to teach a broad spectrum of things easily right now. So having that kind of you know ultimate personal assistant, we're quite a ways away from that. But the conversation, the kind of like I'm talking with another person, we're totally there. Educate us a little bit on the challenges of the technology here and how some of the advancements in recent years fit into this, because I think it's hard for us normal humans to grasp how hard some of this is because we think, oh, you just do some programming stuff and then you teach it how to learn and then it learns stuff or something. But you, when you actually start talking to technologists and they talk about problems like getting a computer to look at a picture and recognize what's in that picture. Like this is really challenging stuff. It's not like it just knows how to do this. Well, it's a really great point, Josh. It all boils down to data and experimentation. There's actually very little programming involved in AI. The number one challenge most people have is, do I have the data to teach the machine? And to do that, you start with what we call the ground truth. So these are rules on how to make decisions, not the decisions themselves. And then you give the machine tons of data and it learns, right? As it looks through the data, like we do through observation, through experience, it tries to find those dots and how they get connected together. It's just that it can process millions upon millions of different variables, whereas we can handle maybe 12 to 20. 
The other thing is you have to have the right subject matter experts, but you can, we can only teach the machine what we can monetize, right? We, we don't know how to teach imagination. We don't know how to teach creativity. But there are some things that are surprising. My buddy Ross Goodwin created an AI, Benjamin, that can write original film scripts. Wow. And people are like, wait a second, how does it do that? Can it create art? Well, no, it, it can't create art. But we've found a way to commoditize how you write a film. It turns out that every movie ever made fits into one of 12 archetypes. So you teach Benjamin the 12 archetypes, you teach it a little about characters, teach it a little about plot, and suddenly you have an AI that can write a film script. Can you put like your own details in it and say, well, I want this main character to be like this and do this, and then it like fills in the blanks as well? You, you could, but you're also then kind of limiting the potential the machine can unlock. Right. The more rules and constraints we put on, it might give you more of what you're looking for, but we might actually then limit what's possible. You know, in my, my Watson days, we actually worked with Bon Appetit and we created Chef Watson. And so Watson could actually create original food recipes. Right. And people are like, well, it doesn't eat, it doesn't taste. So is it just replicating stuff? No, it actually came together with ingredient combinations we never thought of in 50,000 years of human history. Like we, we, one of the first things we said is, uh, you know, come up with an original recipe for a healthy barbecue sauce. And Watson's like, what do you mean by healthy? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> High fiber, low calories, right? Okay, great. Came back with a recipe with like butternut squash and chairman, like and basically stuff you don't find in barbecue sauce. And we were like, ah, the course is not working, right? But we made it. Tasted like barbecue sauce. It was healthy. Barbecue sauce and movie scripts. Uh, has anybody actually <laughs> made one the of these movies yet? <laughs> Sunspring is a short film written by Benjamin. So that was actually made the guy from Silicon Valley, Thomas Middleton. Yeah. Actually produced and directed the short film. <laughs> Sunspring? I'm going to have to Sunspring, look that up. Yeah. I think I th it, used, it used to at least be available on YouTube in its entirety. I don't know if it's still there. With the progression of deep fake technology recently, where you can put, you can essentially create videos that look like a real person, but it's all generated. It'll be interesting to see when AI gets to the point where it's not only writing these scripts, but generating the entire movie. And it looks like a live action film. And yet the whole thing, there was no shooting and nobody even wrote it. It's just generating it. We can look forward to that in the next few years, I guess. Uh, well, given what's COVID's done to the production industry, that might be, uh, yeah, it might be expedited. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go back a little bit because one, obviously, again, we talk about hope, right. And kind of where we, where we create that hope and what the strategies we employ in order to pull ourselves, you know, out of difficult situations and progress and stuff. Your parents are immigrants to the U S from where did you say, were you, where were you born? I was born in New York. Okay. You were born, and where are your parents from? My mom is actually from the UK and my dad's from India. A lot of entrepreneurs that I can, I mean, the ones off the top of my head, I think of like Gary Vaynerchuk. I think of Elon Musk. I think of others that are really influential and, and may, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of them, but there's this kind of immigrant background to a lot of very successful entrepreneurs. I mean, if you look at the American dream, right. In quotes like that, that is all as a result of immigrants that, that sought opportunity and, and had hope for a better future. You, you said earlier that you'd learned a ton from your parents and that they instilled in you this need to do good and be good. And just for the sake of doing good and being good and not necessarily waiting for something in return. I mean, what other lessons did you learn from your immigrant parents? One that you still think about on a regular basis. Cause I think we all have that, right. Whoever raised us, I think you're like doing something and you're like, Oh yeah, that's, that's from, that's from what he used to say, or she used to say, you know, what are some of those lessons you learned one? And then two, why, why do you think, or what's your take on, on this immigrant spirit that drives such innovation and entrepreneurship? And, you know, how have you seen those things kind of play out in your own life? Great questions, Corey. So, I mean, I think two other things to took away from my parents, some that didn't probably didn't really crystal until I was older. One was this, the sense of kind of risk seeking right? That risk is not necessarily a bad thing and there's going to be uncertainty. Take calculated risks, but you have to take risks in life. And part of that means also making assumptions. Mm -hmm. So rather than get paralysis by analysis, sometimes you have to say, look, I've got to go with the information I know and hopefully I'm making a good decision and don't base your decision on the outcome, but 
the information you have on the time. And so we'll be willing to take chances. And that actually went up unlocking a lot of doors for me because I was willing to do things that either just like seem foolish or just like people like, why, why would you leave the safety of this? Totally. All right. And that I think translates with the other one, which is the magic happens outside your comfort zone. Right. I look at what my, my parents did and they scraped, they had some success, they had some failures, but you know, a lot of good things happened in, you know, to my family and to them because they were willing to step outside their comfort zone, which I think a lot of people aren't again, that's willing to do because it might be too much change. And I think this is the special thing about American culture and American innovation is, you know, the country was founded essentially by immigrants, you know, people that were very much risk seeking mm-hmm. and willing to take more because I've, you know, I've been to other countries where they have a little bit more conservative type of culture. And I think this is one of the big benefits is like, why is, why are these, all these great ideas, all these things coming in the U S it's, I think it's kind of wired into our DNA now, right. That we had such a large pool of rich risk seeking people kind of develop that bit of a mindset that we've actually encouraged people to do this. Very, you know, I actually had a protege at my alma mater that he worked for Japanese media ministry of economics, trade and industry. And they specifically sent him for an MBA in the United States because they wanted to start an entrepreneurship program in Japan. And so they wanted to learn from the best. Right. And, and if you know anything about Japanese culture for the longest time, it was, you go work for a company, it's a job for life. You don't think about leaving. You don't think about doing any other things, but even they've reached this inflection point of things are happening so much faster. You want to be innovative. You want to be cutting edge. You got to foster this ecosystem of entrepreneurship. Yeah, I taught entrepreneurship classes for a few years at Brigham Young University, Hawaii. And the the unique thing about BYU Hawaii is that there's, it's a small campus. There's only 30, I think right now there's 3,500 students, but they're from like over a hundred different countries throughout the world. They're all through, through the Asia Pacific really. And I mean, Africa and Europe, I mean, from everywhere that's, it's, it's crazy. And teaching entrepreneurship to all of these different cultures was fascinating because you've got the American students that come in and they've been hearing about entrepreneurship for their whole life. And they're like, Oh yeah, we've heard all the big stories. We, you know, we learned about it even in high school. Sometimes we talked about it, but then you've got students, you know, from Samoa or from Mongolia or, you know, some of these places that are just like, Oh no, that you just, you, you know, you learn a trade, you do it and, and you move on. And so when, when their eyes were kind of opened up to like, Oh, we can create, we can do. And now, I mean, one of the things I taught digital marketing, you know, as, as and entrepreneurial leadership, but they just need an internet connection. I went to American Samoa for a week and just taught how to use the internet in order to get a business off the ground really quickly because it's, it's just so accessible now. It's crazy. It's just something we've never, ever seen before. I hear you. It's kind of spreading that. I mean, you don't need to be an immigrant to a place, to a physical location in order to have that capability, right? Now it's like, no, it's more of a, almost like a mental educational immigration of some sort. Like you need to, you know, get, you can access all of this online and you can stay right where you're at. You don't need to leave Samoa, for example, and go to the United States to do this. You can do it here and build your local economy and build your local community. Right. So that's fascinating. I have a specific AI question. Um, And this, it goes back to the fear mongering thing, right? A few years ago, there was a big news story about Facebook's AI lab or whatever, where they had two AIs that started communicating with each other in a language that they created. And the, the engineers and stuff that were working on it couldn't understand what was what they were saying. And so they shut it down. <laughs> so again, there's such a great headline, right? Like I just pulled Sounds it up. Like a movie. <laughs> yeah. I just pulled up on uh firstpost.com and I was looking in it it said the AI did not start shutting down computers worldwide or something of the sort, but it stopped using English and started using a language that it created. Give me the actual, what happened there? Is that common? Was that something that was, uh, you know, as kind of gloom and doom as they said, or as scary as they said, or is that something that we can expect? And I guess, I don't know what, what's the inside scoop on that from an expert? Cause I read that and thinking like, Oh geez, here we go. There's a bit to unpack there, Corey. So let's let's start with what happened. So they had the two messengers chatting with each other. They started in English and they started speaking in this kind of gibberish, right? And so the engineers didn't know what happened. They shut it down. They spent a few weeks trying to figure out what happened, right? Because they didn't understand. And I, th- I think two or three weeks into it, they finally brought some linguists in. 
And so wow. the people that have the, like the domain knowledge around language took a look at this and said, okay, here's what actually happened. The two machines found English inefficient to converse in, right? <laughs> think about how fast we can think two trillion calculations a second. Yeah. And so they had to come up with a more effective way to communicate. So they created a shorthand language to talk more efficiently. That's what actually what wound up happening. Now, the engineers are obviously linguist experts, and so they didn't realize that. But it's an example of a deeper underlying problem. We call it interoperability, which means, does the forget about the layperson, does the engineer understand how what they're building works? And we're finding more and more situations now where they're very smart technologists, but they're building things that they fully do not understand anymore. And so when an AI does something like that, or they come back with this answer that seems bizarre, right? They're scratching their head on how the AI came up with this. And that's a big problem because in Watson, we built the ability to communicate its thought process. So if we don't understand something, it could explain why it arrived at the conclusion. Most engineers aren't doing that. All, what tends to happen is build me this. And so they build that. They don't think about the ancillary pieces and they only think, the sunny day scenario, they don't think about how things might be used differently or other things that might pop up. And that's actually a big problem. It's kind of interesting. I think going back to the communication of it and the language of it, if you take two 16 year olds on TikTok or something and they're, they're messaging, they're DMing back and forth the way that they're communicating and you were to show that to an 80 year old, they would say, what the heck has happened? What is this language they're speaking? Right, right. They wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't that understand English. the. Yeah, is that English? I mean, the, the it shorthand. would be scary too. Yeah, it would be. The interesting thing is though, that's taken what you know, 60, 70 years to develop, and technology that's come out, and then we've evolved and 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 changed. But it sounds to me like AI is going to do that in a minute and say, "What are we doing? This isn't efficient at all. Let's change." And so it's shortening space and time significantly. Right? It's saying we don't need sixty years to develop this. We need two seconds to download every potential outcome and come up with a better way to do it. Yeah. Look, machines are much better at multitasking than we are. That's why yeah. they learn much faster. Martin Ford wrote a book called Rise of the Robots that I read a few years ago, and it's kind of a doom and gloom book. It's well-written and it was popular and it talks about how essentially the robots and AI are going to kill us all. So what's the easiest way to refute this idea that the robots are going to take over and there's nothing that we can do about it? It's inevitable. It really starts with education, empowerment, and enablement, right? That's actually the, the reason I wrote my book was to do those three things for people. I think too many people are like, I'm a passenger on this journey, right? You got the smart technologists, they're figuring stuff out. They'll tell us what we can do or give us the products and services. And the truth is AI doesn't work that way. You don't have to be a passenger. You can be a driver. The most successful uses of the technology, whether it's business, whether it's nonprofit, whether it's social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, we're starting collaboration. It's the mix of the technology and the domain expert. Legalmation is a great example of this in that there are very successful legal tech company using AI, but they were started by three lawyers. And they went down this path because they want to solve a major pain point in law. And so this all becomes about application. And so I think what I've seen is more as more people have gotten a better understanding of what AI is and what it's not, what it can do and what it cannot do, it's helped improve the comfort level. And now people are asking the question, like, what should I be doing with it? They're looking for a ways that they can actually try and be the driver. So we have to give them the tools to be a driver and give them the tools to be able to do something, you know, enable them to create something. I don't feel anyone should feel like that they have to be a passenger on this journey, that whatever comes, comes. The only way we're going to use this technology for good and avoid these doomsday scenarios, if we all are actively society championing that, right? AI isn't just going to one day wake up and say, oh my God, I got rid of the humans, right? We can make sure that point actually never occurs, but we have to be willing to actually do that. And we don't have to put our trust blindly into all these big companies working on this stuff. The power lies in all our hands. 
So some people would say, well, it's the same with nuclear weapons, right? As long as we all agree to not use them, then that's great. And nobody's going to start a nuclear war. But what about that one crazy guy who says, yeah, I want to blow up the whole world and I'm going to die and I'm going to take everybody with me. Could we see that type of thing happen with AI where somebody says, hey, yeah, I mean, this is just a tool, but I'm going to use this tool to do something crazy. I'm going to use this to start a war or attack my enemies somehow or destroy everybody with a killer drone swarm or something. Unfortunately, it's a possibility. It may be highly improbable, but it's not going to be an individual. It's going to be some group of people or even a country that's going to wind up doing something like that. All right, I'm not saying anyone is actually working on that. But again, this is where it's the right mindset. We can, we can only do so much. I can't, can't eliminate all the possibilities. But as our, the founding fathers of the United States said, the price of freedom is ever constant vigilance. And so it really takes us coming together and working together to ensure that we are making good use and not evil use of the technology, right? If someone wanted to do something evil, we actually have the ability to try and detect some of that. You know, they would have to get lots and lots of data, you know, the, the computing power, the infrastructure. I mean, there's things we can do to detect if someone might have a malicious intent, but we have to be on guard watching for that, which means all of us. So I think about this as a parent, right? With And I, and I actually think about this quite often because it, it's an interesting time to be a parent with, do you have kids? Oh uh, yeah. Two boys. Okay. So I've got two boys as well. I've got two girls too, but so I, I, I'm always like this debate with technology with my kids, right? Like how much technology do we let them have and use? And, and obviously it's personal per, you know, family and kind of what your vibe is and stuff. But for, for us, it's, you know, how much screen time do we allow them to have? How many, how many, how much video games can they play? Do we want them on the internet and YouTube and stuff, or do we not? Whatever. But I also think about it. I mean, we, we run a digital marketing agency. We use technology. We use AI in, in the work that we do in order to perform better for our clients and stuff. And I think, well, the reality is I spend my entire day sitting at a computer using this, this tool, like you said, the hammer right in front of me and the internet and all that it, it allows me to do. And my kids are going to have that on a whole nother level that I can't even fathom. And AI is going to be a big part of that, right? So I'm trying to think, well, how do I prepare them so that they're ahead of the curve on all this stuff? And, and like you said, it, it's in our hands. So do you have any resources or tools or ideas on how, you know, either myself or, you know, somebody that's just wanting to learn more and, and be involved or specifically maybe as a parent, you know, or, or as a teacher trying to educate younger minds on how this stuff works? Yeah, there's there's actually some good things out there. I mean, uh, obviously, aside from my book, which is awesome, <laughs> but uh, there are a lot of uh, the, the companies, even some government agencies have put together a set of resources. So there are some short videos, there's some articles, but there's even like some demos and stuff that parents can see and see the, the impact of some of these studies. But again, the, the goal is to try and educate and make them aware of what the options are. And then you have, you have portals like Cognitive World that kind of help showcase the different areas. Like if you're a parent and you're wondering what the future of work's going to be or what kind of skills your kids are going to have to learn for the jobs of tomorrow, there's a lot of that actually out there for them like that. The challenge, though, is things are changing so rapidly and there's so much unknown that everyone wants to know what is that job of tomorrow going to be. And the, the honest answer is that you got to create the future. you got to create that job of tomorrow. You know, at my, my alma mater, uh, I, you know, I introduced the dean of the law school to the legal mission guys. And she came in thinking like this will be an opportunity for to see some legal tech tools and which tools we should teach in our curriculum to get the law students ready for jobs. And she uh, looked at what they're doing and realized, oh, my God, the nature of the work's going to change in the next six years. What I'm teaching the students is going to be totally outdated. I need to figure out what they will be doing. And so she was asking me like, okay, who can tell me that? And I was like, no one, <laughs> right? The best way to do this is for you to be the one that defines it. You're the one who can create it. And so that actually led her to embark on actually creating a whole set of resources for the law school and the legal industry. So there's, there's a lot of good information. There's a lot of help out there. But at the end of the day, the takeaway is if you're wondering, like if you're a parent, what to, to do to get them ready, exposure, 
but help them create that future, create that future learning, create that future job. I want to dive into some of the future visions of what AI can bring to us, but I want to start with one that's uh, near and dear to me personally, because I've got a daughter who just turned 15 and wants to drive in a year and another daughter who's 12 and would also like to drive next year if she could. So how soon are self-driving cars coming and uh, what can we do to speed it up? It sounds to me like you're doing something right, because for some reason, all of the teenagers I know have no interest in driving anymore. Like that used to be like, <laughs> I was, I was still in the car a year early just to, just to feel what it was like to drive. And every teenager, like all my nieces and nephews and stuff are like, nah, I don't really care. I don't really. So I'm glad your kids are wanting to drive. Cause I think that means you're, you're doing something right. That's a good gauge. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. I, you know, my friends with the uh, older kids, like one's 22 now, zero interest in ever driving. Not even get this learner's permit. You know, what used to be such a rite of passage. I know. It's like, well, why would we want to go out and explore the world when we can just sit here on our phone and explore the world from from here? Pros and cons, man. It's funny because I hate driving, but I've always hated it. I got my license a year late because I was like, why would I want to drive? Like, if I can get somebody else to drive me around, like... What's the point of me getting a driver's license and having to pay insurance and stuff? And now I'm like, ahead of your time. now I'm just like, man, I want to take a nap. Like <laughs> get me that self-driving car so I can take a nap when I'm driving somewhere. But so what's the future of self-driving cars look like? Cause it seems like we're so close. In some areas of the world, we're already there. Singapore has been using self-driving buses and taxis for over two years now. Even in my neighborhood, there are self-driving cars that can operate within the city and take you around. In California, it's actually legal to use self-driving cars on the freeway. So I know a lot of people think, is is this 10, 15 years away? This is, again, it's a people problem, right? For the most part, the technology is there. It's a little bit of perfecting, but it's people accepting, you know, it's no one behind the wheel. So even in China, I think Mazda has just achieved level five certification in automation. And China's planning to make self-driving cars actually legal. And they have the most complex and most variable road conditions out there. But the problem is, do people have trust in the technology? And I think that's that's kind of been the major impediment that people feel like, well, the car is not perfect, right? Why should we use it? And it's like, well, it's still a lot safer than human drivers, right? The, the real question we actually discuss in the United Nations is that, when do we legalize autonomous vehicles? Is when do we ban human drivers? Having lived in China, I can testify that uh, <laughs> the sooner they get people off the roads over there, the better. <laughs> I feel like I understand pretty well how this all works. And I've read quite a bit about it. In fact, a few weeks ago on the podcast, we had the project owner for Ford and she, she's in charge of the AI division at Ford. I can't remember for the for their automated car. So we talked to her a little bit about this. But can you give us the role that AI plays in automated vehicles just at a high level so that anybody that's listening and and sees it in the news and is fearful of it. I mean, I would, I, you know, you just on your commute to work, count how many people you see texting and driving or watching YouTube and driving or watching Netflix on the way to work, whatever, right? Like I think there's, it's safe to say that you know, a Tesla that's on autopilot is probably safer than that person that's trying to multitask while driving. But for the person listening that doesn't understand in the in the slightest how that technology works and why it would be safe, can you can you kind of explain that? Yeah, absolutely. Right. As as humans, we drive with our eyes pretty much, right? And so self-driving cars, they use cameras and you need AI to process the objects and images. But self-driving cars also use LIDAR information, radar. Auditory, it's actually known that you'll hear the kid about to run across the street before you see the kid. They're using IoT sensor information in the roads, the car, and other cars, and the traffic lights. Just imagine that if you can make a blind turn and know exactly what's beyond that blind turn already before making it, that's what AI does. It's processing thousands of different data points in real time. So it, it knows everything around it is getting real-time information to you know, transmit it to it. As humans, we can't process that much information at once. We just don't have the capability, but AI does. So imagine that you're using your eyes, your ears, your nose, you know, your sixth sense, you know exactly where their cars are, their speed, all this kind of stuff, where, you know, the general direction they might be going. 
Imagine if you could anticipate what the other drivers around you are exactly going to do. That's what AI actually gives us. Ultimate defensive driving. Yep. Of course, again, and I hate to keep going back to this, but of course, all you hear about, well, not all, but for the most part, maybe 90, 10 split, 90% of the time when you hear about self-driving cars in the news, it's because one of them crashed, right? Bad news, right? Bad news, right? That's, I think that's the exception at this point. I think for the most part, I mean, I wish they would do share a news story every single time somebody made it safely from here to there. And that being said, though, where can it go wrong still? I mean, if you've got thousands of data points that are coming in and it still messes up sometimes, where, where does that happen and, and how do you eliminate any of that? I mean, is it possible or is it always going to be like a human driving? There's always the potential for it messing up. Yeah, a that's a good question, Corey. Unfortunately, there's no way to eliminate all those possibilities. I mean, the, the weak spot for AI and self-driving cars is a first of a kind event, like something that's never happened before. Yeah. So it doesn't really, it's never had to, it's never experienced this. And so it has to make a snap decision. But it's the same thing with humans, right? Totally. Right. We 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 want we want to believe, and it might be true that we're better at making snap decisions. In some cases, we are. But when you have a fraction of a second to react, you know what's going to happen. And the truth is, is how often do those first of a kind things actually happen? That's actually one of the reasons why we talk about banning human drivers. I wrote a whole whole, whole Forbes article on this, and that. You can actually reduce the the probability of a first of a kind by removing human drivers because they actually inject more variability into the system. So it'll never be 100 percent. It's just unfortunately like I, I freak people out with this example. But if I ask you what's the acceptable fail rate of an airplane, what would you say? Zero. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not possible. Right. There's this there's a number. I assure everyone it's a really, really small number. We know a certain number of airplanes are going to fail. And it's just the same thing with autonomous vehicles, right? But we have to take a look at what's the trade-off here, right? Is this small risk that's smaller than human drivers worth it when 20 million people around the world die or suffer permanent horrific injury and self-driving cars will reduce that number by at least 90%. Seems like that's all you need, right? There, There it is. Yeah, right. Put all the money into that. 20 million lives. How can we get human drivers illegal tomorrow? That's the question. But I guess that's a question for a politician, right? Uh, Before your daughter turns 16, at least. (laughs) Yeah. But it's exciting, though, to think about this with self-driving cars, because you talk about a first-time event. The thing is, if AI has a first-time event, that first-time event goes into the database or the cloud, and all of a sudden, every single car around the world Now, that's not a first-time event for any of these cars anymore. Whereas with a human, every time a human has a first-time event, well, so what? It sticks with that human and maybe a few other humans around them. But there are tens of millions of other humans out there that have never experienced that event and won't learn from the event the way that AI can. I mean, if we got AI on the roads within months, maybe years, it would know everything there is to know about what could possibly happen but we could do that with humans for the next thousand years. And we still, we wouldn't really have made any progress from where we are today. Sad, but true, Josh, sad, but true. Yeah. Distributed learning is a huge advantage AI has over us. And those, that's how it works, right? I mean, so for example, just putting it into practical statement here. So, so Tesla, if you're, if you're an autopilot and you're driving your Tesla and it doesn't pick up some construction ahead or something, and you have to take over the the wheel, isn't it, 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 recognizes that and then it sends it back to Tesla, right? And then they make an update so that, and they work on that and they use that as a, as an example in order to change the software, right? It, it, it does. So the, the AI actually learns it. The thing is that and then every Tesla knows that. So let's say you're on autopilot and you have this kind of really weird curve, right? And it, it's trying to do it and you grab the wheel and you do it. And so it'll learn from that. And the second time, Right. It's, it's doing a better job, but not quite right. You grab the wheel, it learns again. And the third time, then it gets it. But the thing is that one Tesla teaches every other Tesla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can all do that turn now. Yeah. When you put it into that, it's like if I could, on my drive to work, learn something about driving that, that saved my life for the guy's life next to me. And immediately I could tell all of the other drivers this exact same thing so that that mistake doesn't happen again. When you put it into that, I don't care who you're talking to, then that's like, oh yeah, no brainer, common sense. Let's do it. I've never thought about it that way. That makes. And the other thing is 
it's not just what the sensors are on your car, it's the other cars around you. So if you have, if you're driving in traffic and you have 50 AI driven cars around you, well, the car that's 50 feet ahead of you or a hundred feet ahead of you can be sending signals back to your car saying, Hey, this is what's coming up. Get ready for this bump, this pothole, whatever that's happening. It's not just what's built into your car. It's don't get me started on this. It's too (laughs) exciting to think of the possibilities. So what are some of the other advances that we can see in the future due to AI, Neil, that are going to make our lives better and make the future more bright and hopeful? This is already happening, but you think about someone that's lost a limb, for example. So we know the brain can still send signals to the phantom limb. And you you probably heard about Elon Musk wanting to do with Neuralink putting the chip inside to go in your brain waves. There's actually a much easier way of doing this. They've actually done this. So doctors... Biologists have partnered with technologists. And they realize the brain sending that signal is a process. And so rather than trying to decode your brain waves, we can decode your muscle and tendon motions. So less variability. And so you wear an IoT sensor device like above your, so you lost your right arm or your right hand, you wear an IoT sensor above your, your elbow and you want to like make a fist or a, you know, a thumbs up. The AI has learned to de- detect what those muscle motions mean and allow you to control a robotic arm. So when it detects that motion and says, okay, he's trying to do a thumbs up, it'll put the thumbs up on the robotic arm. Now, obviously, this is still a bit expensive. You, know, you have to kind of reduce the cost, mass produce. But we now have a way to restore mobility to someone that lost a limb or was born without one. Wow. I think these conversations are so fascinating because if you just think having this conversation 20 years ago, it would have seemed impossible. I mean, we're talking about things and that's such a fun world for you to live in, Neil, like, you know, on the very forefront of this technology, because it's just stuff that you never would have thought was was a reality to. And again, if I went and talked to my grandma about any of these things, she would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> You've lost your mind. This is not possible. Um one of the things that's obviously been huge in the news uh, for better or for worse is 5G, right? There's all these crazy conspiracy theories going around about 5G. So that was kind of interesting. But then also, I mean, obviously all of the network providers and stuff are pushing 5G big time right now. My understanding of it is that we've got LTE right now that is so incredibly fast. I mean, I, I think a few years ago, if I wanted to just be pretty much anywhere and I'm like, oh yeah, the, you know, the Cardinals are playing, I want to watch the game and I pull it up and it's two seconds and I'm watching in HD right on my phone anywhere. That's amazing because I remember when it took a lot longer and it was grainy and it was annoying. That wasn't very long ago. From what I understand, 5G is like a hundred times faster, a thousand times faster than even LTE. I don't know what the number is exactly. I don't know if you know that. It, it is. I don't remember the price, precise number, but it's. I think it's over a thousand times faster. Okay. So a thousand times faster. And I can't remember who I was talking to somebody in the world of augmented reality and AR. Um, and he was the founder of this company in Silicon Valley was telling me that the technology and in, in AR is in augmented reality is there. It's just waiting for speeds to catch up because it's like, oh yeah, like, I mean, you know, minority report stuff, right? Like where you're walking into the store and you're seeing things that nobody else is seeing based on what you were just searching on the internet. Like the technology for all of this stuff is there. It's just waiting for the internet to catch up. And so 5G is supposedly going to be the first time that we're going to have speeds accessible to really allow this huge shift in, in how we use technology and how we use the internet in our day-to-day life with especially IoT stuff, the internet of things like you were talking about. Does that tie in also to an AI and artificial intelligence? Is there, are there things in artificial intelligence or tools that we have accessible or things that we're just kind of waiting on internet speeds to pick up so that things can connect better and f- work faster? There are, and it's more than just internet speed. It's also computing power. Uh, infrastructure, IT infrastructure, unfortunately, has been languishing for 30 years because it's not as necessarily profitable as like software and stuff. But 5G was actually designed for streaming of data and not really just us watching Netflix all the time, but actually to pump IoT information. Mm-hmm. So there's 31 billion IoT devices in the world today. And there's 127 IT, IoT devices added every second. All right. And so all this data is actually not meant for people consumption. It's meant for machine consumption. We're generating tons of data for machines. So we're, we're essentially creating the gas pipeline for our cars. We could put the gas, get the data to the tank. 
we have to get to the AI to run the engine. We just don't have an efficient way to fuel the engine. And so we're kind of overhauling that with 5G. The other thing is just computing power, right? We, we have machines that the AI can crunch, you know, trillions of calculations a second, but can actually do more. Real simple example, you know, my Watson days, we worked with TED. And so we actually had Watson watch all the TED talks, all the TEDx talks, including mine. And so if you want to search for something, Watson would tell you not only these are the talks that are most relevant, but the segment of the talk that was most relevant. So it could tell you the exact right clips and recommend other similar topic areas. And people thought, this is amazing. Why don't you have Watson do this for YouTube? Because think about how much content is out there. Oh, yeah. The problem is, is we don't have enough computing power in the universe to do mm-hmm. that. Right. There's so many videos and so many things out there. This is why there's so much emphasis on quantum computers, because that will accelerate exponential growth and computing power. Oh, this is great stuff. I think we could go on for hours here, Neil. Uh, As we wrap things up, is there any parting thought that you want to give us in terms of the future of AI and how this brings hope to you and your vision of the future? I encourage everybody that everyone can do something with AI, whether it's for your business, for your community. So definitely be the driver, but don't, don't give in to the fear. At the end of the day, Remember, it's a tool. Think of it as a hammer. Do, you, do I want to use this to create something or do I want to use it to destroy something? That's what we should all be thinking about. And so if you're really worried about AI or trying to figure out how you can be hopeful about it, think about how you can use it to create something, right? That's what we're doing for AI for Good with the United Nations. So there's a lot of opportunity. And I encourage everyone to tap into that. Neil, thank you so much for being with us here today and talking about your hopeful vision of the future when it comes to artificial intelligence. My pleasure. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Corey. Yes, yeah, good to have you. Hello, it's Corey here. And I just want to thank you so much for listening into the Hope Strategy Podcast. I hope you're enjoying it as much as we are enjoying having these amazing conversations with these incredible individuals talking about hope. We'd love it if you wouldn't mind liking, subscribing, and leaving us a review on iTunes or Spotify or anywhere that you listen to your podcasts and share it with anybody you feel that can benefit from these messages of hope. Thank you so much for listening to the Hope Strategy Podcast.